Why should I vote? Why should I vote? Why should I vote? What difference does it make? When you vote, you get to tell your legislators and lawmakers how you feel about issues that are important to you, like public safety, education, and social security. You should vote, because freedom isn't free. Voting can make you Superman for one day. Fighting for truth, justice, and the American way. Because rights are like muscles. If you don't exercise them, you lose them. So go out and vote. If you don't use your right to vote, you may lose your right to vote. So please vote. Get out and vote. Your voice, your vote. Because as Bob Dylan says, a hero is someone who understands the responsibility that comes with his or her freedom. It's your life. Politics does affect your daily life. Vote. It is our right and duty to vote to ensure the continued freedoms we cherish. I vote because democracy requires it. When you vote, you make your voice heard in our local government. And when you do that, you're able to change the world in a way that you would not have before. I voted because I wanted a free sticker. If you want to have some effect, you need to vote. If you don't vote, you may lose the right to vote. Many people have given their lives for the right to vote. The least I can do, maybe the least you can do, is to support their lives. Because what you value is more connected to laws and policies than you know. Voting is an important right. So I urge you to practice good citizenship. Your vote is your voice. It's one of the most powerful things you own. Use it. Why should you vote? Heavens, that's something that everyone should do. I would encourage everyone to vote. It's easy to sit and complain and shame and blame. Instead, get involved. We do that by voting. Voting is a right that generations have fought for and people in many countries are still fighting for. Vote. Welcome to Get Ready to Vote. I'm Jerry Nelson and I've been helping the League of Women Voters for over 20 years deliver uh, help to citizens to get ready to vote. And with me today is Steve Simon, our Secretary of State in Minnesota. Um, he is here to answer the, any questions that you might have about how you can be a, a, a voter in the state of Minnesota. As Secretary of State, Secretary Simon is responsible for ensuring that we have a fair and impartial election system in Minnesota. He tells us that he is willing to work with anyone of any political affiliation from any part of our state to protect, defend, and strengthen the right to vote. Secretary Simon also oversees a wide range of services for Minnesotans. Uh, the, uh, the Minnesota businesses, and he also administers Minnesota's address confidentiality program for victims of, of domestic violence. His goals as Secretary of State are to expand the access to voting and remove any barriers to voting, make business services as streamlined as possible, and strengthen pr protections of, for victims of domestic violence. And he wants to be a Secretary of State for all Minnesotans. We are honored to have him here today. So, Secretary Simon, uh, let's start with the first step, registering to vote. Right. Uh, who needs to register to vote? Well, first I want to thank you for having me. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for all its wonderful work. I really appreciate this. This is another of uh, many opportunities, I hope, um, that will enable people to have more information about voting because that's really more than half the battle, getting that information out there so that people know what the rules of the road are. Right. Your first question is about registration. Well, registration in Minnesota and in almost every other state is the prerequisite for voting. You gotta do that before you do anything else. So the people who have to register to vote if they wanna vote are all eligible voters in Minnesota. But there's a second class of people that have to register as well, and those are people who either um, just moved here, there's a 20-day residency requirement, 
Uh, people who maybe moved within Minnesota from place to place, and now we're in a different place. People who maybe changed their name. And most importantly, people who have perhaps fallen off the voter rolls because they haven't voted for a period of four years. All those folks have to re-register again if there's been some change of information. But fortunately, it's never been easier to do. In fact, we have a website, mnvotes.org. That's mnvotes.org. I'll be referencing, referencing that a lot today. And there's a lot of information there about how to do it, including, in the last two years, the ability to actually register to vote online. That's new, that's fresh in the last two years. That led in 2014, at its inception, to a 55% spike in the use of absentee balloting, uh, because people can now register to vote online. So that's huge. That's wonderful. So what do you need to, what do you need to have with you when you register? Well, it depends when and how you do it. If you register online, which again you can do uh, at mnvotes.org, if you register online, you need one of three things. You need a driver's license, you need a state ID card, or to give the last four digits of your social security number. That's online. If you register in person, um, let's say uh, on election day, for example, because we have same day voter registration in Minnesota. If you do that, then you need to basically prove two things in Minnesota. And this is kind of the, the thing to get in, 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 in our heads. The two things are you've got to prove that you are who you say you are and that you live where you say you live. So it's really not that complicated. And the way that's done is you can use a primary form of picture ID. It can be a driver's license, a state ID card. It can be things like a veteran ID card issued by the VA. Passport. And it can be a passport, exactly. And we have a long list of, of what those are on the website, mnvotes.org. And then you can couple that, uh, if it doesn't have your current address on it, you can couple that with a utility bill or something that does have your new address on it as well. So there are many, many ways for people to be able to register very easily, very conveniently uh, in person, whether that's the day of the election or beforehand. Great. So once you've registered, now if you're like me, you might say, now it, did it really go through? How right. can I find out right. that I am truly registered? Well, that's a good question because people want to sort of trust but verify. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple different ways. One is to go to mnvotes.org, that same website. Mm -hmm. You're going to hear me talking about that a lot. And you can check whether you're in the system and whether you're registered. Mm -hmm. Another way is to simply call your local elections office. In many places in Minnesota, that will be a county auditor or some other county official in the metro area. It tends to be someone a little bit more specialized within a particular county, but you can call them and give your information and just check to make sure that you're on the list. And keep in mind, and, and I, I really want to emphasize this, for folks who aren't on the list or aren't sure if they're on the list, we have same day or election day voter registration here. So don't worry, we're not like those other states where you need to have pre-registered before the election. Anyone in Minnesota can show up the day of the election and even if they're not registered, they can register right there on the spot if they can prove that they are who they say they are and that they live where they say they live. So that's the great advantage of Minnesota. So even if someone does do the checking on mnvotes.org or with the county or with the city, doesn't mean they're out of luck. To the contrary, they can show up right on election day and they can get registered. Don't you always also send out a postcard that says where you're going <clears> to <throat> register or where you're going to vote? That's right. And that comes when you register. That's right. When anyone registers, and whether that's online or whether that's registering uh, you know, in person at the government office, you're always going to get a postcard in the mail that A, confirms that you're registered, and B, also tells you where to vote, where your polling place is. Now, the League has been helping high school <clears throat> students for many years who have turned 18 or are turning 18 before the election to get registered to vote. Um, what advice do you give to people in the, that kind of a situation who are possibly going off to college or some other other place, but they still their main residence is still at their parents' home? Right. What What do you tell them to? Are there options? Yeah, there's no question. You know, when people turn 18 in this state and in this country, there's typically a lot of mobility. Um, they're they're moving. Maybe they're moving within Minnesota. Maybe they're uh, moving outside of the state. Whether it's going to school or uh, going into the military or working. And, and there, basically, the obvious answer is that um, people have to choose. You can't vote in both places. You can't vote twice. You have to go where home is to you. And where home is to you could be on a college campus, for example, either in Minnesota or elsewhere, or it could be at uh, your parents' residence. But either way, you got to pick and choose um, and just go through the same process there. So uh, my advice to students would be pick one 
and, uh, and then just go through the process there. If it's a change from where you've been living before, you're gonna have to register and register that change. But you can just do that through the conventional ways. And if you go to mnvotes.org, there's a one-stop shop there to walk you through all the steps of the process. Very good. Um, <clears throat> so tell us about no excuse absentee voting. Uh, That's, yes. There's been, been some changes in that. Yes, big changes. Well, this is something near and dear to my heart. Uh, when I was in the legislature, I actually authored this um, piece of reform in my last term in the legislature. The old rule, the old rule in Minnesota used to be that if you wanted to vote by absentee and not have to show up to a polling place on election day, that you had to sign an oath, basically, under penalty of perjury, that you were either really, really sick or that you were going to be out of town that day. But what happened was there was some white lying going on and there were some people who just wanted to do the right thing by voting and we in the legislature at the time thought to ourselves, why are we making lawbreakers out of everyday Minnesotans who are trying to do the right thing? So we thought it was a good idea to get rid of the excuse part. You no longer have to give a reason or an excuse. Any one of us now can vote absentee, can vote from our kitchen table, can vote from our couch for any reason or no reason at all. And the way to do that now is you can even order that online. You can go to mnvotes.org and you can order that absentee ballot. It'll come to your home. You can fill it out at your own convenience from your couch or kitchen table. You still have to get a witness to sign it and then you simply mail it back. So we really are in the situation now where people can vote on their own timetable. We have a long 46 day absentee ballot period in Minnesota. So 46 days before a primary election or a general election is the window within which anyone can order that absentee ballot, vote from home, vote from where they, wherever they want, and then send it in. It's tremendous convenience. It led to that 55% spike in 2014 in absentee voting. I predict that more and more people in Minnesota are going to take advantage of that freedom and flexibility to vote on their own timetable, vote from where they want, but still do their civic duty. So I think it's a huge reform. I've been voting absentee because I'm an election judge in a precinct not my own. And I have really enjoyed that because I can sit at my computer with my absentee ballot and look up to find out about candidates. Right. So that's, that's just a huge advantage. And that brings me to the, my next question here. Um, I've had people tell me when I'm registering them to vote, usually in the high schools, well, I don't think I'm going to vote because I, I don't have any idea who these candidates right. are. Um, now, the League of Women Voters, that's been our, our whole purpose. In, well, not our whole purpose, but one of our major purposes is to help people become informed voters. Right. And we've, we will be having a series of candidate forms this fall um, mm -hmm. to bring the candidates together face to face, ask them the same question, and they answer that. And it's just amazing how well you can understand where these candidates are coming from, who they are, what their stand is on issues, which is why we need to, you know, that's, that's what we, you know, it's so important to look at issues and find someone who thinks the same way you do to represent you. So, um, and the other thing is that we, um, you know, we, we have so much emphasis on the president, but the, our local offices, our, our city council people, our mayors, our county people, our legislators have a much bigger impact on our daily lives than the president and the congressman. So, this is a, a chance that you can find out about your local people and really, so I really encourage you to, to, um, to do that, that extra step. And because our, our um, cable stations are so good about taping these, you can find them online, you can watch them, um, watch them on your cable television. But still, there are people that aren't going to do that. So right. what other advice do you have to become an informed voter? Well, I will say this. Um, first of all, this is another opportunity to thank the League of Women Voters for its outstanding work. I know from being in the legislature for 10 years before I had this job that there is almost no substitute for the League of Women Voters candidate forums all around Minnesota for various levels of offices. They are a great opportunity for voters to learn more. But in case people don't have uh, the time or the ability to look at that information, there are other avenues where people can get information. For example, if folks go to our website, to mnvotes.org, there is a section on there called My Ballot, which has at least two great resources for voters. One is an actual sample ballot. So 
depending on where in the state that you live, uh, a voter might say, well, I don't even know who's on my ballot for these other offices. I know President of the United States. I might know a statewide officer, but I don't know who the county commissioner candidates are or the city council candidates are or the school board candidates are. You can find that on the My Ballot feature at mnvotes.org. Secondly, there's a place on that same area of the website that links to various candidate websites. So a, a voter wanting to know more about the candidate, at least in that candidate's own words, um, can go right there as well. But you know, let me speak just a little bit to the broader point. I, I have a strong opinion on this issue of people sort of self-selecting out of voting, saying that they're not going to vote because they don't feel they're fully informed or they fully understand everything. Yes, we'd all love to be informed about every candidate up and down the ballot. But oftentimes, that isn't completely possible. And I strongly urge people to vote anyway. And if they feel duty bound to skip a particular contest because they don't know, that's OK. They shouldn't feel guilty about that. Ideally, we'd all know enough about every office. But I sure would hate to see hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands or more Minnesotans skip voting because they felt self-conscious about the fact that there were two or three or four or more offices that they didn't know everything about. I think it's important to vote for what you do feel comfortable about and confident about, and then determine, maybe even in the, the ballot box or, or, or in the booth, whether you're going to vote for the rest. But there are opportunities out there, particularly with the magic of Google and, and, and searchability, right. for people to find that information. And I encourage people to do it, but I hope people don't kind of self-select out of voting because they don't feel absolutely confident and comfortable with knowledge on every single ballot line of the ballot. I think that would be a mistake. I, we also collect all of the literature that we get at, in our mailbox and talk to candidates at the door. And I keep it all in one spot so that I can, then when I'm voting, I can look that over again and review, you know, the, the people that, so there are lots of opportunities out there. True. Okay, so let's move on to election day itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, how long are the polls open in Minnesota? The polls are open in Minnesota from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. That's been the case for a long, long time. So it's open for a 13-hour period. That's for people who want to vote in person, kind of the old-fashioned way, showing up and voting in person on Election Day. But again, just to reiterate, because I think it's important that people understand that we have so many more options now. People can vote for a period of 46 days before the election, can vote either in person absentee by going to a government office, like a city or county, and if there's any question about where that is, they can call their city or county or go to mnvotes.org. And we now have no excuses absentee voting where people can vote from home, from the comfort of their couch or kitchen table, also 46 days in advance, so they don't have to go to a polling place anymore. Uh, it's still available, and the vast majority still do that, but I just want to make clear that people understand. But if you do go on game day, so to speak, and vote in person, kind of the old-fashioned way at a polling place, it's 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Great. <clears throat> Um, I have two friends that recently became blind. Can they still vote privately? Yes, they can, and that's been a uh, big priority, I think, for my office now and for secretaries of state who have preceded me, access for the disabled of all kinds. And when it comes to those who are, uh, have, uh, are voters with vision impairment, we have, uh, on a mandatory basis, in all polling places in Minnesota, an assisted voting machine of some kind. Federal law says we have to do that. We gladly do it in Minnesota, and every single precinct, no matter how big or how small, how urban or how rural, has this piece of equipment. And that affords the opportunity for people with vision impairment to vote truly privately. Um, and, and that's a great gift, I think. Yep. So what other, other things are covered by that machine? Well, that machine also accommodates people uh, with hearing difficulties. It accommodates people who have mobility issues. Uh, to common uh, people who have a, a sip and puff device, for example, uh, who don't have the use of, of their arms, perhaps, uh, who are paraplegic or quadriplegic. Uh, but you know, we also have other methods of voting on election day as well that, that people sometimes don't know about. We have basically um, vote from your car or drive up service as well. If there's a voter who is disabled and doesn't feel as if they can get out of their car and go into the polling place, under Minnesota law, election judges, uh, multiple election judges, usually one from each major political party, can step outside and do curbside voting, service right at the curb for someone from their car, if that's in a particular case necessary. And election judges have been uniformly good about accommodating people who want that service and, and claim that need. So we do have curbside voting in Minnesota. Speaking of election judges, <clears throat> um, how are we doing with <clears throat> election judges? Or do we have enough and can people still sign up? 
Well, uh, there's, there are never truly enough, uh, <laughs> so we always want more. Keep in mind, in Minnesota, and we have a great record of administering really good, clean, efficient elections, it takes a huge team. It takes 30,000 election judges every election in Minnesota, every primary, every general election, every year. 30,000 people, that's quite a team. And hats off to the local election officials at the county level, at the city level, sometimes at the township level in greater Minnesota who recruit and retain these folks. But there's always some turnover every year. And so it's important to recruit new people who can be trained to do this. It is not too late, it is almost never too late for people to sign up to be election judges. This is a paid position in almost every jurisdiction and it varies by jurisdiction, by county or city or township, folks are paid by the hour uh, for the work that they do for that 13 or more hours during a day. And I want to emphasize one particular need. We have a growing and important need in the state, and it's really all over the state, for bilingual election judges. People who can speak more than one language, who can help new Americans, who are citizens, who are eligible to vote, but who nonetheless might, uh, for technical matters, whether it's voting or anything else, prefer their native language. Um, and I think that's an important and growing constituency in Minnesota. It's very important, it's very natural for us to be accommodating folks in this situation. Uh, and I think we have to do more of it. You know, I know from my own experience, my mother was an immigrant to this country. She was from Austria. She spoke fluent English, almost accent-free English. But I know from her experience that when it came to technical instructions, whether it was how to run an appliance or some government document, she preferred language, uh, she preferred to read things in her native tongue in her own native language, even though she spoke fluent English. The same is true today with uh, our newest uh, immigrants and our new Minnesotans and new Americans. They too prefer technical matters of all kinds, including government matters and government instructions in their own native language. And so we want to be able to accommodate them. So the more bilingual election judges that we have that speak some of the languages that correspond to our newest Minnesotans and newest Americans, the better. So if you speak another language and you want to do uh, right by your community and get paid for it, uh, you, can all, uh, you can either look to mnvotes.org, that website, again, for opportunities to be a part of it, or contact your local city or county to understand the opportunities for getting involved in helping our elections run smoothly in Minnesota. Thank you, Secretary Simon, for explaining the nuts and bolts of voting. Remember, if you have further questions or as you have questions, go to minvotes.org for all your voting questions. Um, for all the reasons that citizens gave at the beginning of this program, I encourage you to exercise your right, your privilege, and your responsibility to vote. And now we have a story about a young man from Champlin Park High School who went to his caucus and had a great experience. Um, well, here um, we're going around to all the, the senior classes and we're uh, just going through and trying, encouraging people and facilitate, facilitating the opportunity for uh, us seniors to register to vote for the upcoming election here. Um, well, I, I think it's personally, I think it's really important just as a, as a, as a demographic, as youth voters um, to, to participate in our, in our politics. And it's kind of an abstract system we have and it's kind of, there's a lot of apathy, I guess. And so to kind of drive us, us kids to, to, to register and to vote, I feel it's just really important. Just for a long time, since I was young, I've been really interested in like history and stuff, and just politics in general, like seeing it on the news and just being really curious and wanting to learn more. So um, here, I think, at the, at the local election here, um, I went to the, the local precinct caucuses, um, and it was it was my first time. I had kind of no idea what I was doing, um, but it was still a really great opportunity um, to participate and learn more. Um, and so we did all that, and then I um, was elected to be a delegate at the uh, Senate district at the next level um, to go up. And so I, we went um, to the, the next caucus, the next convention there, and I participated in that one as well. Um, I think I think it's a really interesting election. Um, no matter what side of the spectrum you are, um, however you may feel, it's certainly interesting, and I feel it's it's very important. Um, so, however you may feel, to express that by by voting and to just participate, and I think it'll be very interesting to see how it goes. So, why should I vote? I mean, what's the point even? I mean, like, does my vote actually matter? Why should I vote? 
My mom says if you don't vote, you can't complain. And I like to complain. Your voice is what matters, so go out and vote. The ballot is stronger than the bullet. Abraham Lincoln. Your vote does make a difference. Elected officials don't know what you want unless you step up and vote. If you choose not to vote, somebody else will, and you may not like the outcome. Remember to vote. I am here to say that not voting is the act of a fool because you give away the election and you lose any right to talk about the results. Because like Plato said, the price of apathy is to be ruled by evil men. Go out and vote. I'm a constant voter because there are many issues that I'm interested in, such as environmental conservation, separation of church and state, the gun laws, and so forth. And if you don't vote, you're not gonna come out on the good side of any of that stuff. You should vote because bad officials are elected by good people who don't vote. You should vote. You should vote because every vote counts. Many elections, even state elections, are determined by only a few votes. So your vote counts, you should get out and vote. To set a good example for our young people, we want them to come out and vote because we've had many lives that have been changed because of men and women going to war or serving in other countries here on, in the U.S. They've been injured, we've lost them, they aren't here anymore, and in their honor, we need to continue to vote. Since not everyone agrees with who the elected official should be, the only way for my voice to be heard is for me to go vote. Well, if you like the way the country is going, or if you don't like the way the country is going, please get out and vote. You can make a difference. And you know, it's been shown in the past that even one vote has been able to determine the outcome of some elections. So every vote counts, get out and do it. People in America have the right to vote, and of course the right not to vote. They have the right to complain. Maybe they shouldn't have the right to complain if they don't exercise their right to vote. Democracy is not a spectator sport. This is a favorite slogan of the League of Women Voters, a group begun 90 years ago to help educate newly enfranchised women who had finally won the right to vote. No, wait! The League of Women Voters does more than just encourage you to go out and vote. You know that, right? The League of Women Voters has been a training ground for some great leaders. The League brings issues you care about to the front stage. Oh! And the League of Women Voters isn't just for women. Men, you can join too. Everyone is welcome. I'm joining the League of Women Voters. I'm joining the League of Women Voters to represent my generation and other generations to come too. Do something that matters. Let your voice be heard. Don't wait for change, be the change. Join the League of Women Voters. Did you know that in 1776, the Founding Fathers of the United States of America decided that their official language would be English, not German, by one vote? Did you know that in 1948, President Truman carried Ohio and California by less than one vote per precinct, thereby winning enough electoral votes to give him the presidency? Did you know that in 1960, one vote change in each precinct would have defeated John F. Kennedy. One vote does make a difference. Please vote.